Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the um, uh, July 9th, 2014 meeting of the City of Lake Forest Plan Commission. <clears throat> I am Michael Lay, Chairman of the Commission, and at this time I would like to uh, introduce the members of the Commission uh, who are here this evening. There are five of the seven of us. Uh, at my far right is Commissioner Berg. To my immediate right is uh, Commissioner Culbertson. To my far left is our brand new member, um, Tim Henry. And uh, to my immediate left is Commissioner Anderson. Um, so we have a quorum present. From city staff, uh, we have Kathy Zerniak, who has stepped aside just for the moment. Um, <clears throat> Our first item of business is a public hearing oh, you did that. No, and an action. Uh, let's see, have you been sworn in, Tim? No. Kathy, do we need to swear in Mr. Henry? No. Okay, very good. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, is a public hearing in action on consideration of an amendment to the uh, uh, zoning court code dealing with special uses relating to medical cannabis dispensaries and cultivation centers in response to uh, state legislation. Uh, the proposed <laughs> amendment would establish the types of facilities as special uses and establish review criteria. Uh, first, we'll have a, a presentation by city staff. Kathy? Thank you, Chairman Lay. The Plan Commission previously heard an informational presentation on this topic. <clears throat> uh, there is some background in your staff report. The state did adopt an act that allows medical marijuana, medical cannabis dispensaries, and cultivation centers in the state. <clears throat> That, that act also gives the city the authority to establish some additional criteria. Uh, that act does not allow the city to prohibit the facilities uh, with any municipality. <clears throat> However, based on the language of the state act, um, Lake Forest has really very limited likelihood that we will see these types of facilities. Uh, you do have a zoning map before you. Uh, the act put in place by the state does not permit either of these facilities in any residential district. Uh, the city has, uh, the city of Lake Forest is primarily zoned residential. Uh, we have various R districts, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5. Those are all some, some shade of yellow. We also have our general residence districts, our GR districts, that tend to be more of a tannish. In addition to prohibiting these facilities in residential zoning districts, the state act also establishes a limitation uh, for how close these facilities can be to various educational institutions, high schools, elementary schools, daycares, for example. <clears throat> so again, although the city of Lake Forest um, under that act has very little vulnerability, we do want to recognize the use in our code. Uh, we did present this item to the city's legal committee and had the discussion of whether these uses should simply be permitted outright or whether they should be permitted through the special use permit process. Uh, the Plan Commission, uh, some of you are familiar with the special use permit process. Um, because Lake Forest is prim primarily a residentially zoned community, institutions like churches, elementary schools, private clubs, <coughs> Lake Forest College, Lake Forest Hospital, those are all approved by special uses. In addition, certain uses in the business districts, drive throughs for instance, are approved through through the special use process. Uh, Lake Forest has historically used that process to provide for a thorough public review, to provide for public notice, 
and a special use permit for a new use does require public hearings before the Plan Commission, a recommendation from the Plan Commission, and action and approval of an ordinance by the City Council. So it is a very, um, it, it's, it, that process allows very careful review of any such requests. At the direction of the Legal Committee, we are presenting to you a code amendment that would direct that these uses, if someone were to petition for those within the community, would not only need to meet all the requirements in the state act and receive appropriate state licensing, but they would also need to be, they would also be considered as special uses and would go through our process. Uh, the special use criteria speak broadly to compatibility of use, uh, availability of adequate, adequate infrastructure, um, in addition to those general criteria, we're recommending some specific criteria that would pertain directly to these uses alone. Those are detailed in your staff report. Uh, they do repeat the distance requirement as, as uh, established in the state act. They add a few more requirements. They speak to a limitation on signage that goes beyond what our current sign regulations <coughs> permit for uh, businesses. Uh, also speaks to hours of operation, limiting those essentially to daytime hours. Uh, they do not, uh, the regulations as recommended would not allow these facilities to have a drive-through as part of uh, the business, would require parking lots to be visible from a public street so that we're, if, if these were to be established that they would not be hidden away, that they would be visible. Um, and also require uh, some security measures on the property, including cameras. Keep in mind that through a special use, of, use permit process, the plan commission could recommend additional conditions based on the specific location and the specific request that came before you. Uh, we do expect that this is gonna be an issue that uh, we're gonna continue to watch. We're gonna see what happens in other communities. We're gonna um, watch closely to see if state legislation is amended. So as with any code provision, this isn't something that would be set in stone, but essentially what it does is it acknowledges that these uses are now permitted in the state and puts a process in place that would assure that there would be a careful review. That concludes my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> any questions uh, of staff by members uh, of the uh, commission? But I had a couple. Um, what have the other communities around us done? And I, I had heard recently that Libertyville, for example, has put something through. Uh, and so is this in keeping with what other, I mean, I clearly our city is different in terms of the residential concentration, but I'm just kind of curious as to what our neighboring communities have done. In the fall of last year, uh, city staff did participate in a countywide task force. Um, together, we, I think we ended up having probably 16 to 18 municipalities represented as well as the county. And, and we researched, consulted attorneys, and, and put together really a, a very long list of what types of limitations might be put in place. And some communities, I think communities who have uh, more vulnerability or more opportunity for these uses, uh, have craft, crafted much longer uh, limitations, a, a much longer list of limitations. Um, some speak to um, uh, the age of people who can go into the facility. <clears throat> uh, some speak to whether uh, this facility needs to be a standalone building or could be part of, of a larger building or a complex. Um, uh, some speak more directly to lighting or signage and, and speak to wording that can be used on signage. Um, we try to put in, in place a framework that, that would give enough direction up front, but also recognizing that through the special use permit process, if a particular location required specific uh, additional limitations, that that process, the special use process, could put that in place. So yes, some communities do have uh, more regulations. Some communities are not using this, a special use type process or a conditional use process. Uh, they would allow a petition for this type of use to come in as part of a building permit application. 
so it would be an administrative review. In those cases, additional criteria would be appropriate. But we have, have limited these to, to be reasonable, to generally align with other portions of the code. Um, for instance, speaking to specific words that, that may or may not be used in signage. Uh, from a, a legal perspective, the City of Lake Forest has really tried to regulate signage through size, color, location, but has tried not to speak to content. So that, that's a, a philosophical and a legal decision. So I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, I guess it, it would be, and maybe this is kind of unfair to ask this question, but I would be curious in particular what, not so much like Block, because my, my hunch is they haven't perhaps addressed this yet to this extent. No. They, they may have. Okay. But I, they I guess I'd be concerned about High, Highwood and Highland Park, which neighbor, you know, us on the south and have more uh, commercial um, parcels uh, for in the overall zoning of those two cities. So anyway, I, it's, it's just... Uh, curiosity maybe and, and in some ways we're feeling like we're making a decision and putting in place regulations unto ourselves and yet we're not necessarily that we do have contiguous communities around us so this might be the kind of code amendment that you direct a review in 12 months uh, so we can come back to you with a report as to whether or not we've had any inquiries what other communities experiences have been it it is a new subject area to be honest <clears throat> that, any further questions of that, uh, that that was going to be one of my questions Kat. we had kind of vetted this through a little bit in our workshop session so if people are listening we had i think about a dozen really good questions and direction that we i think gave you at that time for the drafting of some code amendments as far as you know what we thought about um you know proximity to you know different facilities etc um, some questions I have now are, first of all, are any of these dispensaries in, in operation in the state now? Do we know about any? I'm not aware of any, but um, the, the state was adopting uh, administrative rules. They've gone through that process. There continue to be amendments. Um, I don't know if there's any in operation. I have not heard from any of, our, uh, any of my colleagues generally in this area. That, okay. that they've actually had an application. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, basically, what this is is is, is a, it's for the at least for the dispensaries. It's it's the same thing as a uh, a pharmacy, right? I mean, they're dispensing a medically prescribed uh, substance, right? I mean, the, the they can't just sell this to anyone. They have to actually have a prescription from a physician to treat a certain ailment, or is this? Is, is, okay, so they the idea was we're not going to let them sell this at CVS or at Walgreens. It's going to be at its own separate facility. That's how the state's handling this, correct? That is how the state's okay, handling. Okay, so this. when I go into the pharmacy, I'm dealing with a registered pharmacist that has you know the training and the licensing and all that. Is that going to be the case with the people that work in these dispensaries? Are they going to be subject to that same kind of? Uh, Regulation? Are they going to be people that are licensed physicians, or are these going to be people that get a little quickie in how to sell cannabis? And there is a state licensing requirement for these facilities. They they just can't come to a municipality and and open the doors. They do but, need to get a license from the state. They're not. But they're not going to be registered pharmacists. It's not for recreational yeah. use. Okay. <clears throat> I, I guess my question was, I, I'm kind of interested in the types of people that are going to be working in these places, if it's going to be something that is of the same kind of, you know, um, say a responsible individual that you would go to a pharmacy and get some prescriptions from. Um, and and, and we, that won't be under the jurisdiction of the city. The, the okay. state will determine okay. who is licensed. We can deal with the, with the land use issues. Uh, the state also put this act in place with a review period. So th this was considered a temporary act and it will be subject to further review. Uh, I might have missed this, Kathy, but uh, you said all, all the residential zoning areas are excluded. Correct. Um, so what is included? Are all the B districts included, the business districts? Well, and, and the overlap is, yes, the, the business districts will be included in the office districts. The city of Lake Forest does not have any industrial zoning, but then you layer over that uh, the radius 
the for the farms? various uses. Oh. Um, oh, right, right. So the, the so city is, based on that act, the, the city is, um, does not have very much land available, available areas. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Tim? Any questions? Okay. I have no questions <clears throat> at this point. Uh, one thing we do need to take care of, I need to ask whether any members of the commission have any ex parte contacts or conflicts of interest on this matter. No. Seeing none, we'll continue to proceed. <coughs> um, looking through our order of uh, our procedure here, um, we were down through uh, everything except public testimony. Is there anyone here who wishes to uh, speak on this matter? If so, please come forward. Uh, <coughs> please tell us your name and address. And we'd like to know generally whether you are in favor of, in opposition to, or want to seek changes to the <coughs> proposed uh, ordinance change before us. Uh, Roger Moore, 927 Barclay. Uh, this is just a question, and without my hearing aids, maybe I missed it in the course of your discussion. But would a conventional pharmacy be able to dispense this? For example, uh, a Juul, Osco, or one of the existing pharmacies? Based, the answer is no. <clears throat> is that right, Kathy? That's correct. The, these, li these dispensaries would need to be single purpose and directly licensed by the state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Chris Condon and I live at 721 Valley Road. I wanna start by thanking the city council and the planning commission for making zoning of medical marijuana dispensaries and cultivation centers a priority in Lake Forest. It is important to our community and our youth that we do not become a part of a culture that is trying to normalize the use of marijuana. We already have an uphill battle preventing youth from using marijuana. Now labeling it medical marijuana, youth are likely to equate medical with safe. We are fortunate to live in a community largely zoned for residential use with a multitude of schools which limits the options for dispensaries or cultivation centers. Additionally, with the requirements of the Illinois legislation, it's important for us to always keep in mind that dispensaries and cultivation centers should be kept out of the mainstream areas of our community, which are frequented by our youth. For example, if for some reason the legislation has changed, this is not an issue now, but I just wanted to plant this seed in people's minds, that if the legislation were to change, that would allow these dispensaries to end up in a common area that was frequented by youth, it would contribute to youth perceiving the purchasing and consumption of marijuana as a normal activity, which is safe for individuals to engage in. According to the National Institute of Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, normalization correlates directly to teens' perception of marijuana's harm. And perceiving marijuana is not harmful is directly correlated to increases of marijuana use by youth. I am the program coordinator for the Speak Up Prevention Coalition here in Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, and Knollwood, and I am member, a member of the Lake County Underage Drinking and Drug Prevention Task Force. As a member of the county task force, I have heard from local police chiefs and sheriffs who have been contacted by dispensary operators looking for communities that will allow dispensaries to operate in common retail community areas. The dispensary operators do not want to be located outside of the mainstream area of communities. They realize that not being allowed into our mainstream market squares, sunset corner, puts a stigma on their operation. They are actively looking to become a normal retailer in communities. And I can add that um, Lake Bluff did pass um, zoning ordinances. They used the Lake County Medical Cannabis Task Force recommendations and they tweaked them um, very similar to what Lake Forest is doing and they passed those April, May, something like that um, there and they adopted more of them more literally than Lake Forest is but I think there's a difference in what are some of our city ordinances are that capture some of the things that their ordinances don't um, and Kathy and I have been in communication and I think what is being proposed for our ordinances for our community is good. 
I can also tell you that um, there's no current dispensary or cultivation centers licenses that have been given out because the Illinois Department of Agriculture is working on their requirements for the cultivation centers and the Illinois Department of, of Health is working on their requirements for how they're going to license these individuals that are going to run these dispensaries. They expect to start issuing those licenses early next year, about January of next year. So we expect that these dispensaries and cultivation centers, we're going to start to see them grow and, and exist sometime early spring of 2015. I'm in conclusion, I'm thankful to live in a community that is doing what is legally allowed to prevent normalization of medical marijuana in our community. In the future, if a special use request does come up for medical marijuana dispensaries, please keep our youth in mind in, in the forefront of your minds. Thank you. Ma'am, could you remain there for a sure. moment? I didn't swear you in. Is Ooh. there anybody else who wishes to testify? Okay. <clears throat> I need to swear you in. Okay. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you've given us is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry for that <clears throat> oversight. If, uh, if nobody else wishes to testify on this matter uh, during the public hearing process, I will declare the public hearing closed at this point. And now uh, the proposed uh, Special Uses in Non-Residential Districts, Section 46.24, Special Uses is now before the Commission. Can, can I request one slight change? It's sort of silly, but I'll say it, and that is that the first line which says that these centers may be allowed by special use permit, that I would like to add in the word only. So it's may be allowed only by special use <coughs> permit, consistent with, and so forth. Does the commission consider that a friendly amendment? Yes. yes. Kathy, do you have any comment on that? Okay. Okay. Any other suggested <coughs> uh, amendments? I, I have another question, sure. and, okay. and that's simply is, <coughs> are there any other, is there any other methodology under the special use permitting process under which a, a license could be denied to a petitioner? other than those that are stated in the Illinois law and the conditions that are proposed for this ordinance? Are there any other conditions under which a special use permit could be denied? General conditions for all special use permits speak to compatibility with surrounding uses, uh, speak to uh, the fact that the use cannot be injurious to public health, welfare and safety, uh, so what, what are the broad criteria that would be part of any review of a special use permit? Could, could we make the permit be something that uh, has to be um, somehow um, reviewed, uh, almost like a probatory period? where they, they, we issue, say, a special use permit and then things aren't going so well and we would like to take it away from them, but that becomes a very litigious thing. But if we had a review process where we had to, it had to be reissued or regranted, then we would have a better chance of perhaps um, considering whether we want to or not. Is that something that can be put in? And that would probably have to be discussed for each individual special use permit, but I will say in the past, as, as we looked at, giving a special use permit and then saying after 12 months it, it's gone, the city attorney has always encouraged us instead to for each specific, specific special use permit in each ordinance to really write a set of criteria. If those criteria are now not met, the city council has the ability to revoke, revoke, a, revoke a special use permit. Okay. That, that it is a, a specific right granted by an ordinance for a particular property under certain conditions. Okay. So that is very different than a use that is permitted outright. And, and then one more thing that I, that I was wondering about too is that as with the way convenience seems to uh, work with, uh, with, with delivering goods and services, for people that can't access these dispensaries, I can see little vans roaming the neighborhoods delivering this stuff, you know, like Peapod and so forth. And I'm wondering if, if there's any thoughts about that potentially being an issue with people um, or how we might you know, anticipate dealing with that. 
I think that would be an aspect that that will be regulated by the state um, as Ms. Condon mentioned the uh, administrative rules are being prepared but uh, I don't believe the act right now contemplates a, a, essentially a mobile dispensary. It yeah, requires. But I was just a, thinking in terms of what we just heard from that uh, the, the, uh, lady that spoke, or, um, <clears throat> you know, the idea of it being in a fixed location. But if it's, uh, say, a delivery truck and it has advertising on it, because maybe we don't have any kind of ordinances that limit advertising on vehicles. Uh, then right in the middle of a residential neighborhood, we have a honey truck driving around. And so that psychological aspect that we're trying to sort of safeguard becomes sort of a, a kind of a, it's almost a snicker, you know, and I'm just trying to think if there's any way, do we have any kind of uh, power to, to be at least in control of that and decide on whether we want that or not, rather than have to let it happen? I'm not sure that the that the land use regulations speak to whether or not there could be a delivery service. I don't believe the act as currently written would permit that, but it, it certainly is something if and when you get a request, you could look at, we could look at the act more closely, see if anyone else has faced that issue uh, and address that in a specific special use permit. We do currently have ordinances um, that the, the city can afford can enforce that speak to advertising using vehicles as advertising mm -hmm. okay I'm thinking ahead but that we're, we're supposed to be planners so I'm being paranoid a little <coughs> bit, but, okay All right. um, is there any uh, prohibition against the public consumption of cannabis in the city of Lake Forest from a federal perspective cannabis is not legal so yes there there are some some bigger issues about this this act that that go beyond the city of Lake Forest if there were such a prohibition in the city of Lake Forest would that be would that contradict any aspect of this special use proposal I, I think we would have to look at that if and when we received well, a here's, here's my concern you know locating one of these next to a whiskey bar for instance you know might not be the greatest location and i'm just curious as to whether you could make an argument against granting a special use permit in that on that basis especially if somebody could just walk out and light up you know it, it's it's within the 2500 square foot of the school no i'm saying the whiskey bar you know, those are the those are the kinds of issues that concern me a little bit. You know, and 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 those would all be appropriate for consideration under a special use permit. One of the things, uh, one of the aspects that you need to consider with a special use uh, use permit request, surrounding uses, um, and and whether those are um, create a good relationship or a problematic relationship. And whether there is a a danger to the general, to the general public. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I'm not trying to extend this deliberation too much, but when you know, for for the average person to start consuming uh, cannabis in public or even in private is illegal unless they have some need for it that's been determined by a physician. Okay, so let's say that individual does have a need, and they decide to sit down in Market Square and take medicate themselves what 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 is the uh, there uh, are oh, many discussions going on uh, with this act going going forward uh, for instance there is a whole separate area of discussion going on about medical cannabis in the workplace and and what should be done and how that should be controlled so yes the the whole aspect of how and when uh, medical cannabis is consumed is a different discussion uh, separate from the land use discussion. So as far as being able to go out in the parking lot of one of these facilities and consume the product or medicate with the product is something that we really can't deliberate on because nobody knows how it's going to really be played out. I'm just wondering as plan commissioners and if we're going to be talking about planning and these things are going to start happening I just, you know, I, I just don't want to be remiss in not asking a lot of dumb questions now because we're going to be faced with these and they're going to be sort of they're going to seem kind of ridiculous and no one really thought about them and so I'm just trying to broach the well, subject that's, that's and where I'm going and mm -hmm. kind of uh, what, what do we have control over and what don't we have control over and just it, 
And keep in mind that, that if you do receive a request, it will be a re request for a specific, a specific use. You'll know the size, you'll know how it's gonna be operated, you'll know how many employees, you'll know how big the parking lot is, uh, you'll know what uses are around. There may be, as a result of the surroundings, um, there could be a condition that you put on a specific special use, for instance, that says no loiter loitering in the parking lot. Um, but, but those would be tied to a specific location and a specific set of facts around that proposal. Uh, these are really broad, uh, a broad framework that, that's going to um, work with the current special use broader categories to allow that kind of thorough review and those specific questions when you have more specifics about what type of use, where, how big, um, all of those specifics. Okay, I, I see the point. It's I, I have a question. Given that almost all of Lake Forest is residential and that they're not eligible, and plus the other overlays of prohibitions with 100,000, excuse me, 1,000 foot of pre-existing public or private preschool, uh, all of those, does this ordinance, does this code amendment in effect mean that no place in Lake Forest could be considered for a, for such a, a special use permit? The act does not allow cities to prohibit the use. No, but is the way that this code is drafted might that be in effect and subject to challenge that it is in effect a prohibition? The way this is written is, is broad enough that, that if there was an opportunity, uh, if there was a property that was not zoned residential and was far enough away from schools and preschools, um, this, this gives us a, a broad set of categories that does not absolutely prohibit. Okay. Um, the, the likelihood is that we will not see Understood. any request. Understood, but requests. I just don't want to have this suffer the affirmity that indeed it's challengeable on the basis that it in effect prohibits. And, and, and that's and why- the answer is no. And that's why the, these are, these don't get as specific uh, to, to deal with every um, possibility. The, these are broad to really balance that, to recognize that the city cannot prohibit and we certainly don't want to put ourselves in a position where that could be challenged as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, and Kathy, would it be possible, now after we get done with our deliberation and our motions, uh, this will go to city council and they'll, they'll consider our, our deliberations and motion on it. Um, would it be possible for some of, of, our, of our questions that don't have answers at this point, really, uh, to somehow be uh, relayed to the council members, the aldermen, because yeah, I don't think these are things we can make decisions on even if we wanted to anyway. You know, the where do you medicate or do you, you, can you medicate on the way out of the parking lot in your car? Uh, but maybe pass those just by in, in maybe more than just minutes form. Just say some of the plan commissioners thought that it would be interesting to have these, these, these uh, issues somehow on the front burner in their mind when they think about this because they're gonna have to deal with it eventually anyway. Uh, because it's going to be, start coming up, and, and maybe to have it as a kind of preamble, you know, to the to the period of adjustment. Sure. I had one other question back to your point earlier. Is there a, a way or a need for us to actually note here that we want to review this after a period of time, reconsider it, or you can certainly make that recommendation to the city council um, based on the information from Ms. Condon about timing, a, a, a review in 12 months may not give you much. Okay. Um, so, so maybe so it's it, more like within 24 months or something. I, that, I, I'm, I'm that, trying to think about make sure that we, there is a, at least, review. well, yeah, or at least. To what the city attorney had said, that you don't want to be specific in that so that you can, yeah. so that you address it at the point after the special use is issued. You don't want to be specific in how you word it. We're but, trying to get ahead of the matter here and so that we can't be challenged once so somebody to say I'm moving in and I'm waiting to get my state declared dispensary license and they say the lay force hasn't hasn't addressed it. I think we address it clearly and succinctly in the way it's worded here. Well, 
Yeah, I get. We should probably. No, mention I, I, John, I like the review concept. Yeah, I, you know. I. Yeah, I think the issue isn't disagreeing on this. It's just trying to say, do we want to make sure that this comes back for review, or that there isn't a gap or something we right. missed? Are, are you in effect suggesting a sunset provision? Not necessarily. Okay. I just think it's just basically a requirement, if you will, that to be reconsidered or at least looked at again in the context of what <laughs> developing regulations might be out there. And I think that's a, um, I, I can think of at least one other instance where a recommendation has gone, gone forward. If you choose to recommend the code amendment in that language, you could also add a recommendation that, that says um, that, that you recommend that the uh, that staff review the code language uh, no later than 24 months from adoption or at a time when uh, trends, the legislation changes, uh, we can certainly word something like that. But it's somewhat flexible, okay. not necessarily time specific, but also around other changes around it. I, at least it's a suggestion to, to add um, with the yeah. additional. The language I have is <coughs> a, a recommendation that the staff review not later than 24 months from the adoption of this uh, code amendment and su make any and suggest any necessary amendments. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Any other amendments to the recommended uh, code amendment language <clears throat> hit before us? Seeing none. Um, I think a motion to adapt. This would be an order with the two revisions to insert the word only uh, in the first line of the uh, <clears throat> staff recommendation and then the, 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 the uh, Anderson recommendation I just outlined. Okay. So moved. okay, it's moved a second. Second. Moved and seconded. May I uh, sure. offer, I, I like Guy's suggestion too, to forward some of the questions uh, specifically with respect to public consumption um, to City Council for their consideration. Okay. That's something, something Kathy, you'll do as part of your report. And, and we'll discuss those issues also with the police department so when we go to council, um, we can raise those questions and perhaps answer some of them. Good. Okay, all those in favor of the motion before us indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. The next uh, <clears throat> item before us is a public hearing and action on consideration of an amendment to section 46-38 of the code, R4, single family residence district, relating to the use of accessory structures as secondary mm -hmm. uh, living units and establishing conditions and limitations on this use. Kathy? Thank you, Chairman Lay. Early in 2013, Alderman David Moore held a community engagement forum on the topic of granny flats. Um, and at that time, I think the first question that came up is, what is a granny flat? And some people liked the term and some people didn't, but it really has nothing to do with housing for older members of the community. It, it really has to do with uh, use of secondary uh, use of accessory structures on properties as secondary living units on single-family properties. Uh, those units can take the form of a coach house, of a garage apartment, of a gar gardener's cottage, um, structures that have been built in the past for uses that really support the main house. Um, you do have a summary in your packet of the comments heard at that meeting, but there was generally interest and, and I believe excitement about exploring this opportunity uh, to really o open the code up a little bit. And as this was discussed by the community, there really are uh, three focuses or, or three goals in considering this opportunity. One is it, it may be a way to encourage property owners to invest in, uh, restore and preserve accessory structures. Uh, it may be a way to make some of our larger properties with accessory structures more economically viable, more attractive to uh, a future buyer. Um, and third, uh, it really provides a different type of housing product. Um, 
We know that historically our community has uh, had homes, ha has not just had large estates, but has had homes of all different sizes. And many of the accessory buildings uh, have been used through the years, mainly for uh, help for uh, the estates, uh, chauffeurs, gardeners, uh, other personnel. Some of those accessory buildings today continue to be rented. Those have been used continuously as secondary living units and their legal uses, their non-conforming uses, but when those properties change, change hands and an appraiser makes a call about that rental unit on the property, uh, it, it seems like there's some discomfort because looking at the current code, that second living unit, that rental unit, isn't permitted by right by the code. What we did here in the community discussion was concern about how wide you open the door on this issue to begin with. Um, concerns about would it add traffic? Would uh, these rental units uh, be a nuisance to neighboring homes because of their location or proximity to the property line? Um, and, and so the conditions that you see or the performance standards that you see in the staff report respond to some of those concerns that were raised. The Plan Commission did have a work session on this item in 2013 as a follow-up to that community engagement session. Uh, at that time, um, you saw some images of accessory units throughout town and, and we looked at some maps. What the code amendment before you tr tries to do is to give us essentially a pilot program for this type of use, for a secondary living unit on a single family property. It limits the use to the R4 zoning district, recognizing that many of these ac accessory structures are east of Sheridan Road. Uh, you do have a zoning map at your place. R4 district is the light yellow district. So it does cover a good part of the community, but R4 tends to cover the larger lots. The recommendation is that uh, we don't move into a situation where we allow s new secondary living units to be constructed, but at, as the, uh, as this, um, at the outset, that what we do is al allow consideration of accessory structures that exist at the time of adoption of this code amendment to be considered for secondary structures. There is a recommendation that rather than the standard accessory structure zoning setback, that an accessory structure that is to be used as a secondary living unit be a minimum of 20 feet from the property line. In the R4 district, in certain locations, accessory structures can be as close as 10 feet to the property line. Uh, 20 feet is consistent with the zoning setback for main houses, side yard setbacks for main houses. Um, <clears throat> during the discussion, and I, I believe this came up as part of the Plan Commission's earlier discussion, uh, there was the thought that if there was a requirement that the main house be owner-occupied with an owner present on the property, as opposed to an absentee landlord, there would more likely be more attention paid to the accessory unit, uh, more uh, involvement with the tenants, and awareness of, of how the accessory unit was actually being used. Um, the conditions speak to availability of parking of at least two spaces for each accessory unit, limit accessory units to one per property, um, and, and some other general, um, uh, general parameters that, again, try and encourage this use as a pilot program, uh, it's not a situation where we expect there to be a wholesale change, but in our evaluation, we found a, about 60 accessory structures. Now, not all of those come anywhere close to being structures that could be inhabited. Some of those are garages. Um, but if, if we had a guess, we'd say that this might be something that, that maybe 20 properties take advantage of. Certainly, the accessory units would need to meet minimum building code requirements for living units. Uh, they would need to have bathrooms, they would need to have running waters, and they would need to have kitchen facilities, um, <clears throat> and they would need to have egress uh, in, in the event of, of a fire. 
So there would be that level of review. We're also recommending that if someone is going to do a secondary living unit, or in the case of someone who may already have a grandfathered in accessory unit, that on an annual basis they register that unit with the city. Uh, perhaps there's a nominal fee, perhaps the council would decide not to charge a fee, but that would allow us to keep a record and keep public safety both police and fire informed of where these units exist so that they would just have that information. So interested in your comments, but it, it is something that from the staff perspective, I, I think we've heard support for giving this a try. Questions <clears throat> of uh, Kathy. I, I have one, Mr. Chairman. Um, would, would, this, uh, would this code permit new construction of accessory dwelling units? As written, it would not. It, it says that accessory structures that exist at the date of adoption of this ordinance, and that was specifically to, um, that, that really is a whole separate discussion, and that goes to density. And one of the purposes of this was really to look at <clears throat> and make some of our historic structures more viable in some of our large estates. So no, as written, it would not. <clears throat> So just to clarify, you could actually build it, right? But you couldn't use it as, or are you saying it would not be allowed to be built? Accessory structures are allowed by the code. Yeah. Uh, they must conform to setbacks. Yeah, they yeah. must conform to the square footage on the property. You couldn't use it right. in this context. You, you could still build a new accessory building, but the code would state a date so that we wouldn't have this flood of people coming in. There would be those other regulators um, for, for accessory structures that might be pool houses or right. um, a studio or a workout room, this would not change the current code requirements for accessory structures. <clears throat> well, now, okay, when you first went through this, it said, like, B, the accessory structure predated the date of adoption of this code provision. So let's just say it gets adopted in a month. That means that <clears throat> in Lake Forest, if someone wanted to rent out a granny flat, that that structure, that building, will have had to have predated August 9th. So I guess, no, you can't build a granny flat. Is that, is that what you understand well, it to be? I, well, I think what it, what, the way I interpret it is you can build it, but you can't use it as a granny flat. Okay. The, this can't would not prevent out. the construction of new accessory units. Okay, I understand. I thought it, you were- If on my property I wanted to okay. build a garage, and if I met the code requirements, I, I wasn't over square footage, I... All right. But it would... I understand, but... Accessory dwelling units. Right. Yeah. Right. But, it would but be now, an accessory about, structure. Okay. Well, what about the person that comes in and says, okay, I have the code here, the provisions of this ordinance. My accessory structure right now is just a shell. It predates the ordinance, but I want to build it out and turn it into an apartment. That's okay? Now, see, that's uh, uh, the literal interpretation part that we talked about at the la where our workshop. So, that, and then if they we're going to let them remodel this thing, because we want to promote the use of these things and the spirit of this, I think is great. I'm just trying to kind of catch up on the possible manipulation of this thing that could happen. And yes, this this would allow, if there was an existing structure that perhaps was a garage with with some. Um, Loft space. Maybe a, a room or two above the garage or some storage space. Yes, this, this does allow the possibility for someone, uh, if, if the structure met building code requirements, to come in and, and put a bathroom and a kitchen. Um, to retrofit it as a living quarter. Correct. Okay. Okay. Kathy, explain to me whether or not those nonconforming uses would have to come in and be <clears throat> registered and, uh, and in effect approved? Or would they continue to be a non-conforming use under the code? If, if, you re if you recommend that this goes forward, we would actually work with the city attorney and there would probably be an amortization period for those units and, and say any units in existence at the time of the passage of this ordinance would have 12 months to come in and register. Okay. And then if, if someone, if an appraiser called us three years from now and asked about a unit and it wasn't a registered secondary living unit, then it, it would not be in compliance with the code. Okay. 
So that's additional language that you would have to work on with the city attorney before it got final action by the city council. Correct. That's a good oh, point. Okay. Other questions? So this, in essence, will have an effect on the existing granny flats that are being rented to some what illegally because it's going to force them to be upgrade their their standards to meet the current code requirements in essence if there are building the the accessory units just just like many homes in town they, they don't have to be fully in compliance with today's building codes it just would never happen but if there was a life safety issue the the structural and life safety aspects of the building codes there there are some minimum requirements that need to be met to allow a space to be occupied so yes that that would need to be demonstrated my only my only concern would be that I, I think the code as amended makes sense. I just have a concern about um, item G and just the additional paperwork requirements and potential for fees. If the, if the spirit is to encourage the highest and best use of these properties, are we asking them now to annually come and submit more paperwork to the municipality and to the state? I, I, I think that there, there would be, it would make sense to maybe make that less onerous on the property owners would be it was my only comment okay question on on provision d no more than one secondary living unit is permitted on the property what if there are two or three ancillary building it's a very large lot obviously it's, it's more than sixty thousand square feet let's say it was a hundred thousand square foot lot and there was already two or three on there why do we limit it to one? Good, good point for discussion. Well, R four is is what sixty thousand. Greater than sixty thousand, right? And is it greater than or greater than sixty thousand? I mean, we have an R five that's a minimum one hundred and thirty, right? Right, and and maybe that's what our chairman might be referring to. And, and in that case, can we review some of these things and we, we make variances on the ordinance that pertain to those specificities? And or you could tie the number of. Keep in mind that all properties in the R four district are not sixty thousand square feet. Some are smaller, in fact, and and some are much larger. So maybe. Um, Maybe that gets tied, as, as you said, to a, a size of a property, or, or maybe you don't limit that. Maybe, again, we were trying to open the door slowly, but I, I think it's I mean, worth discussion. One way discussion. to do this would be to amend what you have here as one secondary living to two secondary, to two secondary living units. If they exist, right. Yeah, they would have to they exist. They would have to exist. I mean, the right. two ancillary buildings right. would right. have to exist. Right. Except in the case where there's one that's truly living and the other one's the garage shell. that they're right. gonna, Now we're going to give them the opportunity to retrofit that. They didn't sure. have it as a living quarter. That's where the thing starts to get, you know, it, it could escalate. And I guess, do we want to just set that in motion? Are these too many things to worry that's about? I'm raising. <clears throat> And frankly, it was based on a comment that Commissioner Cushman had uh, sent me just in a brief email. Mm -hmm. Do we really want to limit it? So I, <clears throat> the topic is not, my original thinking was one that uh, Commissioner Cushman raised. I don't know. I guess my reaction is I'd rather limit it than at least at the start. Than, okay. I mean, my, it, it, to me, this has a purpose of, of allowing it but containing it in this kind of community and seeing how it works there yeah. you go. and Kathy we can always we can always grant variances right isn't that something that we have the ability to do to where we saw that this was a grand old estate and and that there were you know there was such a degree of upkeep necessary to keep it as a, a complete unit and that yeah we'll let this person fit out this other building so he has two and the, it looks like it would be a good environment etc cetera, etc cetera. and that would probably be a a, a pretty extraordinary zoning variance the the zoning board of appeals would consider that and and when you're actually adding a 
a living unit as opposing to encroaching into a side yard setback five feet. Uh, you, you could certainly request that, but it may be a, a difficult thing to consider through the variance process. But it, it may be if, if you want to tie that so if to we, total if, lot square footage, that could be another approach. So it's important for us to talk about this now because if we allow for the, a provision for it, then it's not all tangled up in a, in a web that can't be undone. So I, I, I kind of like the idea of it being in those circumstances where it's, you know, one. very unique, you know, to let them have more than one. So how do we craft that language so it doesn't get abused? Well, it would seem to me one way to handle it, and I don't want to get into, we've got a, we need to get, take public testimony on this, but would be, there would be nothing precluding if we had a petition that didn't fit the ordinance to suspend consideration of it, not we, but the city would, until the commission and city council considered the matter to revise it as presented. That could be done. In fact, a petition could come forward asking that the code be amended. Um, yeah. Or you could you could approach this differently and and not put a limit. Um, I, again, I I think both the code amendments tonight aren't code amendments that are going to change the world. We're just trying to make make a few inroads here. But maybe you don't want to limit it, and if it becomes a problem, we come back and limit it. That that's another approach to leave it more open to start with. And I, right. I also thought the suggestion, I, I think by Commissioner Berg, it, it would also make sense to have this apply to our five and our four districts. That's what I was yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I would make that change. Okay. Okay, well, let's, <clears throat> Further questions of Kathy? Then let's let's move to the uh, to the public hearing portion of uh, this matter. Uh, but before we do that, I have to ask on this one: Do members of the commission have any ex parte contacts or conflicts of interest on this matter? Seeing none, we will proceed. Uh, I take it there are people here who would less like to uh, appear before us on the public hearing on this matter. Let me swear you all in. If you would, could you please stand? And I will. S <clears throat> Do you s please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Thank you. Roger Moore, 927 Berkeley. Uh, a lot of us attended uh, the meetings that uh, David Moore had in uh, 2013. Actually, I'm surprised there aren't more people here tonight because those meetings were very well attended. Uh, but the last item on your list, I'd like Kathy to address this. Be, that's the uh, limitation on the number of people unrelated. Because that was a fairly big issue in those meetings. And I'm curious to know, how this was arrived at, uh, there was concern for, let's call it the kinds of people who would be occupying these residences. And uh, if you could address that, because I remember it being a, a subject that was discussed at some length back in 2013. Do you want me to respond now or after? Um, actually, that is the exact language in the current city code. It, it seemed appropriate to repeat it here. In the city zoning code, the definition of family is no more than three people unrelated by blood or marriage. And, and that actually applies to all, all residential properties in the city currently. So it, it didn't need to be added here, but you're right, it was raised as a question, so it seemed appropriate to repeat it. But it comes directly from the code. And the history of that, as I understand it decades ago, really was to address boarding houses and um, a lot of people living in a single family home. This also, this provision is also used um, with some of the rental homes near the college. 
So up to three people not related by blood or marriage are permitted currently by the zoning code. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next person to testify. Your name, address, please. Hi, my name is Dave Gwinnell. I live at uh, 537 King Muir Lake Forest. Hi. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we may be one of those 60 properties that you mentioned, Kathy, or not. I'm not sure. Um, I, you know, I don't know whether I live in R3, R4, or R2D2, whatever. Um, but it sounds like it may be opened up to R5 and R4 now, or you're thinking about that. And uh, we happen to live in one of those quirky, quirky properties that may be one of the 60. Um, our situation is that we've got a common drive. We co-own the drive to get to four buildings. Um, interesting situation. Um, we've always been very fair with each other in, in uh, you know, how we operate. It's been very gentlemanly, uh, handshake kind of relationship. I'm not sure I would do that again, but uh, um, we've been very cooperative with each other. With, with this um, proposed um, secondary living unit uh, uh, provisions, I, I just wonder if it may be um, uh, not restrictive enough. Um, I know you want to get into it slowly, which I think is a wise kind of move here. Um, but um, I, for instance, I would not want another person going across my driveway with their services constantly down the road. We, we moved there because it was quiet. You know, it turns out that we've got a lot of service trucks coming down to the point that in the 23 years that I've lived in Lake Forest, we've replaced our driveway twice, not just patched it, <laughs> replaced it because there's so much traffic on our single shared driveway with a third you know uh, owner or you know tenant there this would vastly increase the traffic on the single use you know co-owned driveway i'm wondering if there might be a provision for a non-encroachment for this co-owned kind of situation something that would restrict it a little bit so you know I'm perfectly willing to have another person down there under a certain set of circumstances. If it was a quiet family, that kind of thing, I would consider it for my neighbor. I want to be a good neighbor, but I don't want a situation where I'm suddenly, you know, forced to allow access to my property, which I don't think would be legally correct. Um, so I, I would just want to, you know, state that pretty, pretty strongly. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for your suggestion. Next person. <clears throat> oh, I like that. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my name is Rami Lopez. I live at 410 East Woodland. I, I had not planned to testify, um, but it occurs to me that I have an accessory unit on my property. And, um, and I would like to look at um, letter um, E here, on-site par on parking for two vehicles for the tenants of the secondary structure. In my case, and I would imagine that this is fairly widespread, um, our structure would only be appropriate for one person. I wouldn't even want more than one person, but it's that size. So I would be held to having to have two units, two parking spaces. So I'd rather see the parking tied to the number of people, the number of adults, I guess, on the lease, um, than start trying to put pressure on, let's say in Dave's case, on my neighbor to put in another little parking space and start angling in that, in that, in that way. So this would prevent me from having, having a tenant if I had to have those extra that extra parking space. Thank you. So just to be clear, you're suggesting that the we not say two parking spaces, but and stay say instead maybe no more. Well, it has to be a minimum of one space, obviously. Right. Um, or as determined by the number of adults on the on okay. the lease. I don't I don't know. I'd have to nuance that, but um, okay. I'm clear. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Next person uh, to testify. Uh, 
Uh, hello. My name is Deborah Fisher. Uh, I'm currently a resident of Lake Bluff. I'm a realtor at, at Koenig Rubloff in Lake Forest. I've been a realtor in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff for the past 21 years. Um, I grew up in the community. I went to Lake Forest High School. I have a son who's a junior um, at the high school. So my roots are both personal and professional. And I did participate in that event back in May of 2013. And just wanted to bring up a few of the points that I think really seemed to resonate with people at that point. Um, on a personal level, I'm one of the ones that fits a category that they were saying this would interest. Um, I did move back here after I finished um, school and was working downtown and did look for a rental here. I would have gladly ha rented a coach house or a granny flat had something like that been available. Lived, rented for a year, saved up some money, and bought a small home in Lake Forest. So. That was one of the groups that I think we were trying to encourage with some of these lesser priced um, housing units possibly being available. And again, I think, you know, I'm sort of a poster child for one of those categories anyway. Um, I think that there are right now on a, pro on a professional basis, we do see a lot of both younger and older potential residents seeking to rent smaller homes in town. We have a very limited pool of, um, rental homes available. There's only 21 homes in all of Lake Forest right now, just to kind of put it in a quantitative level. There's only 21 detached properties for rent right now in Lake Forest in any um, price range. They go from $2,300 a month to $25,000 a month. And the average is, is $5,754. They've been on the market an average of only 43 days. The market moves quickly in that. In the, so those are the actives. And in the past six months in Lake Forest, there were 44 detached homes which went under contract or rented. And of the ones that are past contingency, they were only on the market 34 days. And they rented for an average of 3,576. Um, so essentially, the demand for rentals is high in our market. But it's, quantity, you know, it's not abundant, um, but it is there and the inventory is quite low relative and demand is especially high for the more affordable options so i also firmly believe that allowing owners to rent these structures which were not built to remain empty and many of them are simply because they don't have the ability to rent them out right now um, gives the owners of the property the option for increased income for added income to make the repairs and to refresh the properties um, pay toward taxes, et cetera, and um, also improve the properties, and also just if they want increased companionship, um, live in assistance, whatever, in the, in the property. So I think there's far more neg positives to negatives. I endorse the code amendment to establish it. I would prefer not to limit it too much, as some of you have mentioned. Um, I do think that it's not really fair to penalize a homeowner whose property perhaps was subdivided in such a way that the house is near the road or is near the property, is too close to the property line. That wasn't of their doing, but that's just the way it happens to fly. So I would hate to have a property owner not be able to rent their coach house because of a few feet you know, being off. Um, I also agree that there are some instances where we have, you know, more than one structure on a larger piece of property that has been the both prop, you know, the main house as well as the um, accessory things have been lived in all along. Um, so, essentially, um, I endorse the amendment. I hope it can be broadened a bit, and I hope it proves to be quite successful. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any, uh, anybody else would like to testify? Okay, seeing none, we will declare uh, the public hearing on this matter closed. And we will then move to um, a staff response to public testimony. And I think there were a number of good points brought up, um, both in your discussion and in public testimony. Um, I think the point about a common driveway or an approach to a property that's an easement across someone else's property that that does seem to be a legitimate issue that frankly we didn't consider so that that may be something that um, you'd want to think about uh, the, the the driveway to access the accessory unit must be on the the main property or we can work on that wording um, 
the question about parking. Well, can I ask a question? Is that, sure. I know this is kind of out of order, but why wouldn't the 20 foot setback requirement then preclude Dave Grinnell's situation? Why? I mean, so if you've got a, if the property has to be 20 feet from, I mean, if the, if the, if the living unit, if you will, the, the, the granny flat has to be 20 feet away from the property line, it would be that way on either side. So why wouldn't that avoid that? Maybe I'm misunderstanding. I, I think the issue was that there's a, uh, it, in, in many places in the community, there's a shared driveway that really doesn't relate at all to the setback. The accessory unit could be anywhere on the property, but the driveway may be shared by multiple yes, people. Yes, I, I was envisioning the shared driveway with that would be approaching garages or something that would be close to each other. I think the but common driveway issue is separate from the setback that issue. That clarifies. Um, uh, with respect to the on-site parking, maybe, I think the city doesn't want to get into the position of knocking on the door and saying, how many people are living here and how many cars do you have? Maybe the language is just simply on-site parking needs to be provided. And and that's uh, obviously if, if people are parking in the street or, or on the grass, which would be against the code, then that would be the evidence that there was an issue. So maybe that just gets simplified, not to one or two or three, but just on-site parking. Um, uh, you, you mentioned adding a provision about the amortization of existing units, and I think we'd have to work on that language. Um, the question was, was just raised by Ms. Fisher about whether the 20-foot setback is, is too restrictive. Um, again, I, I think we were trying to be responsive to some concerns we heard. Maybe, um, Maybe the setback distance is, is more important if you're uh, abutting a rear property line. There, there might be some, some further thought that we could give to that. Could that be come before the ZBA? <clears throat> Every time? No, I said it, okay. could, could the 20-foot setback issue come before uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals for a variance? It, it, it could, but again, I, I think if you're writing a code or, or some language in the code specifically speaking to accessory units, it might be a, a higher hurdle for someone to get a variance. Um, I, I'm interested in, in hearing your comments, but I'll just throw a, an idea out there. It, it seems like with this good input, it, it might be worthwhile hearing your additional input and then giving us some time to further work some of this language, because I'm not sure we can craft all this language right now. If you choose to uh, continue this after you have further discussion, you may want to reopen the public hearing and then just continue that as open. So just, just a thought. Well, I would, uh, my statement that the public hearing would close, I would revise that if to include the public hearing portion if the commission chooses to continue the matter, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's. And, and with regard to the 20 foot setback, I think when we were discussing that, uh, the comment made tonight um, by Ms. Fisher, uh, you know, it, the 20 foot may encumber that particular property owner that has the coach house. And I can envision a few of these on the property line. But I think when we were discussing it, we were trying to be respectful of the neighboring people. So you can't have it all one way. And I think that if somebody's paying 15 years worth of mortgage and they suddenly finds out he's got a neighbor living on his property line he didn't have for 15 years, I think we have to be respective of the neighbor's rights too. So, I mean, we can help and we can also hurt. And I think that we have to kind of do a little bit of both here. So I'm, I'm hesitant to throw out that setback. I, I like the setback as well. However, in the, in, in the case where it's on a rear property line and there's nothing but a natural conservancy or open land behind that property, then I would like to see the availability of a variance provided. Yeah, Kathy, can you write that in there? <laughs> actually, yes. I, I actually okay. think you could write something that, that says in the event that... Um, there is no ad adjacent structures within 50 feet or, or whatever the right number is, an accessory structure could be as close as 10 feet. Okay. We, we can certainly play with some of that language. But on that point, does the current code, again, going to uh, 
provision F, the accessory structure is at a minimum distance of 20 feet. Is that the current code? The, the current code, depending on the zoning district, and I can't quote the R5 district, but in the R4 district, the current code allows accessory structures that are in the rear 25% of the property to be within 10 feet of the property line. Okay. So if that, that's why I, th I think your idea of depending on proximity to a neighboring home, I, I think that is something that could be worked in. Okay. Again, with, without a variance going to Commissioner Henry's point that the, the purpose is not to make this onerous, not to make it a special use process, not to require variances, but to make it fairly easy for, for people to do this. What's the pleasure of the uh, I, I, I have one. I hope, I hope this isn't considered silly, but uh, uh, three people unrelated by blood or marriage. Um, can we include adopted children? In I'm, I'm sorry. That's actually in the code. I, I noticed that when I read it. You're correct. I missed that. Do we continue this to allow Kathy to improve? I think that's... That's where I think we're headed with this, unless somebody really objects and wants to try to wrestle with it tonight. Okay, I think the answer to your question is yes. Okay. That we do continue it. Is, is uh, it fair for staff to take away general support for the concept yes. yep. with both some loosening and yep. some tightening based on your comments? Right. Yeah, with the overall um, goal of just making good environment for everyone, right? Yeah, yeah but, but just to say it, I think much of what we have here can stay intact, except for the, the two or three things we specifically talked about. And <clears throat> opening it up to R5 as well. Yeah, R, yeah exactly. Yes. R4 and R5. Yes. Okay. okay, then I will modify uh, having closed the public hearing. I'll continue that public hearing. And... Uh, uh, can I get unanimous consent from the commission that we, in effect, continue the matter of this for staff to come back with the fine tuning of this, but that we generally support it, but to be brought back to a future? I'll commission. make a motion to that effect. Second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that uh, we proceed as just mentioned. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Okay. If anybody in the audience did not receive a, an email or direct notice of this and you'd like to prior to the next meeting, please, if you could just give me your name and email address or mailing address, whichever you prefer, then we'll make sure you get noticed. Okay. Uh, next item, is there any public testimony on non-agenda items? Thank you. Rami Lopat, 410 East Woodland Road. Not to beat a dead horse, but when I think back over the Amberley project, I want to paraphrase Chairman Lay in saying there's an awful lot not to like, but I'd like to say that about the process. So this afternoon I wrote some questions and notes about what I see as improvements that can be made in the review process. Those notes span four pages, but as Mark Twain said, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. I hope you'll read my observations, but here's a few highlights. First, I note that the, and Kathy will pass out the, um, the, uh, the printout. I, noted, I note that the city council didn't vote on your recommendation, so technically it didn't deny the petition. Therefore, Shiner doesn't have to wait a year to come back in. That terrifies me. So my first question is, will the city start where it left off, or will it start afresh? My other major question all along has been, why is this office, office special use still in play? As I read the zoning code, section 24J states, in any case where a special use has not been established, within one year after the date of granting, the plan commission shall review the special use permit and recommend to the city council whether or not the permit should be revoked. Um, 
it goes on from there. While this <coughs> permit originally affected all 38 <coughs> acres, this parcel has changed hands since this permit was granted and is clearly a separate animal now. So my question is, should the parcel revert to uh, the TD district if Mr. Shiner steps away? Especially if Mr. Shiner steps away. We were obviously left flat-footed by a proposal to do retail on this parcel, and we had a difficult petitioner whose negotiating strategy was to just say no. Nonetheless, it would be useful to perform a post-mortem on this and see if improvements to our process can be made. I encourage you to think about a few things. For example, how we can update our land use plans, especially looking at empty or underutilized parcels along Route 60. I'd like to see uh, the Route 60 neighbors convened and asked what they would design as amenities and uses for their neighborhood. I think we should be way beyond the idea of cutting down 400 trees no matter what was approved before we knew better. However, if such a nightmare had to occur, Every last thing should be demanded of a petitioner to be sustainable and innovative. Lake Forest should not be entertaining yesterday's designs. It should be a showcase. So how can we create a higher bar for ourselves? How can we encourage the shiners of the world to come to us with green roofs, affordable apartments above retail, and electric trams to link offices to, re to retail, to residential, and reduce car traffic. Last but not least, my submittal tonight recommends things that you and the staff can do to be more transparent and inclusive of the public. We can avoid controversy and we can avoid suspicion with a few more initiatives, such as better report writing and you helping to obtain answers to the public's questions. But most of all, I wanted to come here tonight to thank you for doing the heavy lifting on such a thorny issue. Thank, and excuse me, to thank you and Ms. Serkiak for doing the heavy lifting on such a controversial issue. Thank you. Thank you. On that point, uh, has the petition been withdrawn? Uh, we have not received anything official okay. at this point. Thank you. Um, I would suggest we take uh, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Lopat's comments here, and then between now and the next meeting, come back to Kathy with any suggestions, revisions, or uh, uh, suggestions as to whether or not how we may want to respond to this. Would that be appropriate? Kathy, do you have sure. it? Okay. Okay, so ordered. Okay, anybody else wishes to testify? Okay, um, additional information from staff? Nothing further. Okay. Did you, based on the questionnaire, are, were there any of those dates that were, look like they might be good for our next meeting? I haven't looked at all your responses okay. yet, um, but, but we will look at those and contact the two commissioners that aren't here tonight and get back to you as quickly as possible with a confirmed meeting date. Very good. Okay. And by the way, who uh, who was the author of this? I, I'm sorry. The the correspondence that you received on the Granny Flats, the author was Art Miller, and he was unable to attend tonight. Ah, okay. I was unable to print it, so I was able to get it. <coughs> Very good. It's good to know. <coughs> okay. okay. Any further business the commission wishes to uh, commissioners wish to bring up? Seeing none, a motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those no. The meeting is adjourned. At eight.